how to, to deal with those things that you're overcoming, praise God. But then here in verse 9, he says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them which are of the household of faith. Praise God. Notice God is telling us that we need to keep ourselves active and involved in doing what God's called us to do and don't grow weary in doing it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you now and praise you for the word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us truth that will set us free. Lord, we bind every distractive thing in Jesus' name. And we set our focus, our attention, our minds upon those things which are above. We thank you, Lord, for giving us utterance. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for working with and confirming your word. And Lord, we receive this word now, working into us and upon us, your will, plan, and purpose. And for these things, we give you all the praise, glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Paul, notice here he said, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Well, he just told you in these verses above what your well-doing and, and acts of kindness and goodness are supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be helping people that are hurting. Amen. Amen. Reaching out. You know, the Amplified says when you go to somebody that's fallen, he says, don't go with an uppity attitude. That's, that's kind of my, my paraphrasing of it. He says, don't go thinking you couldn't fall yourself. In fact, when somebody messes up, your attitude should be, except for the grace of God, that could be me. And so you go with a humble spirit, and you don't go pointing out somebody's faults and somebody's problems. They already know their faults and problems. But you go to them and try to tell, let them know God loves them, and God wants to help them, and how God's there for them. Amen? And, and then he talks about down here, uh, you know, communicating, giving, sowing seed in verse 6. But then he says this. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, he's going to reap. Now, what's he talking about here? He says, if you sow to your flesh, you're going to reap corruption or aggravation. In other words, if, if I keep letting my flesh dominate me, that's what I'm going to have in my life. But if I'll sow to the Spirit and begin to act on the things of the Spirit of God, then I'll begin to get in on the blessings of God. I'll get God moving in my life. And then he gets down here in verse 9. Once again, he says what? And let us not be weary in well-doing. The word weary here means to become weak, faint, fatigued, or tired. So he says, don't, don't get fatigued in doing what's right. Don't get tired of doing what's right. Don't, don't get so wearied and weak that you faint and fall over and you quit doing what God told you to do. Amen? How many of you know that if, if we couldn't grow tired and wearied and get fatigued and get disrupted and, and, and get to the place where we just thought, I don't care if I do this anymore or not. If we couldn't get there, Paul wouldn't have had to warn us. Amen? So that means that we're all subject to every now and then getting tired. Have you ever found yourself, you know, you just keep doing what's right and it seems like you just keep getting, you know, beat up for it. You know, somebody said, what's the old saying the world had? Every good deed doesn't, you know, there's no good deed that doesn't go unpunished or whatever it says. You know, in other words, there are a lot of times we're praying, it seems like we're not getting the headway. Or we're, we're doing the right thing to people and they keep acting wrong towards us. Are you hearing me? So you see, he's talking about dealing with things of life. But notice he says this. If you will not grow weary in well-doing, acting nobly, acting right, doing right, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Glory to God. Notice he said there's an appointed time for you to reap. Meaning what? Don't quit just because you don't see results. Don't let the problem wear you down. Don't let life wear you down. Don't let other people determine how you're going to live. Amen. Just because somebody else backslid doesn't mean you have to. Just because somebody else lost their joy doesn't mean you have to. Just because somebody else didn't get their breakthrough doesn't mean you don't get yours. Amen. No, he says you keep doing what's right. You keep sown to the Spirit. You keep following the ways of the Lord. And notice this is the very last chapter of this book that, that Paul's written to the church of Galatia. So, so he's been telling them all these great things. And now he's coming down to this and he's warning them saying, Listen, don't let the enemy wear you down, get you to the place where you think it's not worth it. Just keep on doing right. Just keep on doing strong. Notice he says this. As we have therefore opportunity. Notice that. See, a lot of times we're going along and God gives us an opportunity. And we don't take advantage of it. He's saying if God gives you an open door. If God gives you a possible opportunity. That you can do something good for somebody. You ought to do it. Praise the Lord. 
And then notice what else he says. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. All men would represent everybody. That means, you know, actually, I think if you read some of the different translations, you'd find out that he says all men, the, the sinner and the saint alike, praise God. See, you and I are not so, just supposed to be Christians to Christians. We're supposed to act like a Christian whenever we're not around Christians. Amen. In other words, we're to let the world see that we're going to do what's right. So he says, if you have an opportunity to do something good for somebody that's a bad person, you go ahead and bless them and help them and take care of them. Praise God. And he says this, while you're doing all this stuff, he says, especially if you see a brother needing a hand, you jump in there and help your brother or your sister in the Lord. Amen. So he's telling us that we ought to be constantly living this life, serving God, letting the world see that Jesus is in us. We ought to have a good attitude. If we see somebody out here in the world and they do something wrong, it looks like they're getting punished for it, we ought not run over there and throw rocks at them and say, "Uh uh-huh, you're getting what you deserved. No, he says, if you have an opportunity to go minister to them, encourage them, help them, you ought to go do that, praise God. So you see, the church is supposed to be out here doing these works, serving God. But how many of you, once again, bring it out again, how many of you found that you're out here working, you're trying to help people, you're trying to help people that don't appreciate it, and then even you go help a brother, sister in the Lord, and they don't even appreciate it. And the first thing you know, if you don't watch out, some things begin to attack your mind, they begin to attack your attitude, you begin to get a little tired, and you begin to get like, what's the use? Amen. Well, look in the 138th Psalm. We'll find over here that the David, King David, he had some of these same issues. You know, in, in, in David's life, if you study David, uh, I shared this in the early service. I, I believe David, you know, was a, a person of high metabolism, high energy. What do you mean? Oh, well, you know, if you, if you read the accounts of David, I mean, that guy was going from the sun up to sundown. I mean, he was into something, wasn't he? And, you know, he'd be running 100 miles an hour doing something for God. And next thing you know, he'd be crying out to God, oh, I missed it. Whoops. You know. And so, you know, whatever he did, he did it with full force. And so, you know, David would be going along one day. And, man, he's shouting and praising God and killing giants. And the next day, you know, David's going, to go, oh, God, help me out of this. Well, you know, as, as you serve God and live your Christian life, folks, and you live for God, guess what? You're going to find out that you're not a perfect person either. And if you're afraid you're ever going to make a mistake, you're never going to do anything. And so what we've got to do is we have to learn from these people in the Bible. We learn from David and we learn from these folks. And we find out that David, he he wasn't perfect in all of his actions, but his heart was perfect towards God. He had a heart for God. He loved God. Amen. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to do what was right with God. And one of the, the great things about David was this. David was always quick to listen to God. When God told him to do something, David was ready to go jump in it and get it done. David was quick to believe God. I mean, when God would tell him he could get something done, David just believed, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Praise God to get that thing done. Also, though, if David missed it and he did fail, you know what David would do real quickly? David would get on his face before God and ask God to forgive him. Lord, I don't want to fail you. I don't want to hurt you. And if somebody did David wrong and they repented of it, David would forgive them real quick and go on with life. Hallelujah. And listen to me. You and I need to understand that in your Christian walk or in your daily walk, you're not going to make every decision right. You're not going to do everything just right. But you ought to do it with a perfect heart towards God wanting to do what's right. Amen? And as opportunities arise, you use your faith and you be a blessing. But David says up here, let's, let's begin in verse 1. He says, I will praise thee my, with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Notice that David says, with all of my heart, I'm going to praise you, Lord. With everything that's in me, I'm going to magnify you. And then notice what he says. Before the gods, little g, I will praise thee. In other words, he's saying this. I'll praise you, God, with everything in me before the world. I'll praise you before religions. I'll praise you before sinners. I'm not going to restrict my praise just whenever I'm in the sanctuary. I'm going to live a life of praise unto my God. And I'm not going to be ashamed of God. I'm not going to be ashamed to express my praise and my my admiration of God. Amen? Now, notice what else he says. I will worship toward thy holy temple. In other words, I'm going to keep my attention on you. I'm going to keep my focus on you. I'm going to keep looking to God no matter what's going on. And my praise, I will praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Remember, the word is truth. So I'm going to praise you, Lord, for your word. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Now, we know that the name of the Lord is exalted and higher than any other name. Amen? 
And David says that God has exalted his word even above his name. What is David saying to us? God exalts his word above his name because he knows that his word is his name. Hallelujah. Now, what is David telling us? You can count on the word of God. The name of Jesus is great because his word is great. Amen. Amen. And so David is saying here, he's saying, I'm going to exalt your name. I'm going to praise your name. I'm going to walk in your truth. I'm going to worship you. I'm not going to be ashamed of you. I don't care what people think about me. I'm going to live for God. Hallelujah. Now look down here in verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Now, wait a minute. This is the same David that just said he was going to worship God with all of his heart. He was going to keep his eyes towards the holy temple. He was going to magnify the Lord, magnify his word. He was going to praise him in the midst of all the other people. And and didn't matter whether he was a believer or not. He's going to let his light shine. And now David says, Lord, in the midst of trouble, as I walk through this trouble, you're going to revive me. Now, listen, if David didn't need revived, he wouldn't ask God to revive him. Hmm? So David starts off this psalm saying, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to exalt his word. I'm going to be a word person. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to magnify. I don't care who's around me. The devil's around me or people that love God's around me. I'm going to worship and praise God. I'm going to live for God. But then David says, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. The word trouble there in the Hebrew means adversity. It means affliction. It means distress. How many of you found now that in your daily walk, there are times you're going to walk and find yourself in a distressful situation? Amen. How many of you have found out that when you're, you're walking out here and doing your thing and living for God, you might face adversity? Amen. And the word also trouble means affliction. Affliction here doesn't mean sickness or disease. It means a hard place. David says, when I'm walking in a hard place, it has a tendency to pull me down. David says, when I'm facing trouble and difficulty and distress, it has a tendency to pull me down. Whenever I'm facing adversity, it has a tendency to pull me down. How many of you have ever, you know, you're going along, you're praising God, then something pops up and it just seems like your heart just drops. That's what David is saying. He's saying, I'm walking in the midst of trouble, God. I'm out here and this affliction is coming against me. This test is coming against me. It's a distressful thing. I'm feeling the pressure of it. God, right in the midst of me feeling all this pressure, me feeling like it's too much, me feeling like I can't make it, instead of me growing weary and becoming fatigued and tired in this walk, God, right in the midst of this test and trial, revive me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's asking God to bring a reviving in his spirit. The word revive here means to keep alive. It means to nourish up. It means to quicken. It means to recover. It means repair and restore. So what is David saying? Lord, while I'm walking through this test, while I'm trying to keep my focus on you, while I'm trying to do what's right, while I'm trying to live my life that's in a way that's pleasing to you, the distress of this thing, the pressure of this thing, the hardness of this thing, the attack of this thing is trying to weigh me down. Trying to pull me down. Trying to get me fatigued and wearied and quit. So God, right in the midst of this test, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to revive me. Keep me alive. Amen. I don't want to walk through this thing dead. I want to be alive while I'm going through this thing. Praise God. And Lord, nourish me. I need to be nourished. I want my faith to stay strong as I nourish on you. Lord, quicken me. Hallelujah. What's that mean, quicken? You ever told, you know, been, been out here and somebody said, quicken your pace means pick it up, praise God. Lord, pick me up, hallelujah. Then also recover me, Lord. Wherever, whatever I need, recover me. Also, Lord, I'm asking you to repair me during this time. Whatever the enemy attacks me with, I want you to repair it before it ever has a chance to fester up and cause many problems. And God, whatever the enemy's trying to steal out of me, restore it back in me quicker than he can get it. Are you listening to me? See, David is asking God to keep him alive and powerful and strong and and doing the things of God right in the midst of the trouble. Notice he said midst. That means right in the middle of the problem, David is going to maintain his fellowship with God and maintain his victory. Amen? Amen? Now, notice what happens when David turns to God in the trouble and asks God to revive him and do all these things. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of my enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. 
What's he saying? He's saying when you're in a test, you've committed yourself to live for God. You've committed yourself to do good works. You've committed yourself to be a blessing as opportunities come up, both to bad people and good people. You're there to live your light. Let it shine. You're going to worship God. You're going to be a Christian. Hallelujah. And the Bible says here that you're going through all of this, and all of a sudden you find yourself right in the middle of a test, right in the middle of a distressful thing, right in the middle of an affliction, a hard time. Listen to me, church. You don't have to miss God to be in a test. See, the very first thing the enemy does whenever you, you know, you're out here, you're trying to live for God, and all of a sudden you're feeling like, you know, this oppression coming on you, or you're feeling this weight coming on you, or you're feeling all this junk and this stress coming on you, the devil hits your mind and says, uh-huh, you missed it, that's why you're in this. You know, if you was living for God and right, you know, you wouldn't have this problem. But wait a minute, David said in another psalm, many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. He didn't say many are the afflictions of the backslidden. He said many are the afflictions, the hardships, the tests, and the trials that come to people that are trying to live uprightly before God. Now, if we stop there, we go, oh, man, that's terrible. But if you read the next portion of that verse, it says, but, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Hallelujah. Meaning what? You need to understand if you're going to try to serve God and live for God, you're going to face some trouble. You're going to have some days that are not good. You're going, to, you're going to try to be a blessing to somebody, and they're going to snap at you and try to bite your head off. You're going to do something good, and somebody's going to try to do something bad back to discourage you. You're going to praise the Lord, and somebody's going to persecute you for it. You're going to come to church and start praising God, and it'll be, you know, the devil has a way of setting you up. You come to the church, and, and you know, you come into a church that's fairly good size, and you decide, I'm going to sit over here. And you go to that spot, and the devil surrounds you by the deadest people in the church. And you lift your hands, start praising God, and they look at you like, what are you doing? And you go, man, I'm sitting in the wrong seat. And you start feeling, oh, God, I'm the only one in this whole thing doing it. No, no, God probably set you there because he wants you to be an inspiration. All the deadheads are sitting around you. He doesn't want you to grow weary and fatigued and say, oh, God, I'm going to quit. No, he wants you to be revived right in the midst of that, praise the Lord. You may try to do something good. You know, you got the water situation. So you try to go do something to good for somebody. And they say, well, what took you so long? You want to open up the bottle and drink in front of them and leave. Amen. <laughs> and so, you know, the enemy's always out there. Are you listening to me? See, this is life, folks. Christianity is real life, us living for, with God in real situations, but learning to trust Him in those situations and not letting the situations bring us down. And so he says, Lord, right in the midst of this trouble and right in the midst of this, this hardship that I'm going through and, and the tests and trials that are coming my way, I'm asking you to revive me, quicken me, nourish me, strengthen me, recover me, repair me, Lord. Just keep me alive in this thing. And Lord, he says, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm asking you to take over this problem. And I'm going to ask you to take your mighty arm and beat down my enemy. In other words, Lord, I'm not going to respond negative. I'm going to turn that problem over to you. Hallelujah. I'm just going to ask you to deal with that. And Lord, and that while you're dealing with that, I'm going to ask you to put your hand upon me and anoint me to get through this thing. Amen. Now, notice what else David goes on and says in verse 8. He says, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. The word perfect there means complete or make mature. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. You see, folks, what's concerning me today might not be a concern to you. Are you listening to me? That doesn't mean that it's any less important than what you're going through or what you're going through is any less important than what I'm going through. It means we ought to be sensitive to one another that everybody needs something in their life taken care of. And so what do we need to do? We need to look to the Lord concerning that situation and ask the Lord to help us to take care of it. Amen? And notice he says, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. He'll mature. He'll complete that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. What's he saying here? He's saying this, Lord, I thank you that you're going to get me through this test. 
You're going to get me through this problem because your mercy endures forever. How many of you know, and if you don't, I'll tell you, in the, in the you know, 107th Psalm, he talks about you know, how we're supposed to declare that the, we're redeemed from the, the hand of the enemy and we're the redeemed of the Lord. But if you go back to the 106th Psalm, he talks about that the children of Israel were defeated because they forgot the mercies of God. Now, what were they talking about there? All the miracles, all the deliverances, everything God did for Israel when he brought them out of bondage was an act of mercy. When Jesus was on the earth, all of his healings, all of his ministry, it was acts of mercy. How, how, many, of you how many times do you read in the Bible, whenever somebody had a problem, they'd come to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on us. And he would minister out of mercy. Listen to me, folks. Mercy is God's love being released to you and me. Mercy is God's compassion being released to you and me. And God says here through David that his mercy, his desire to help us is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Come on. It's always God's desire to help us through our test. Always God's desire to keep us strong. Always God's desire for us to be there at the end, at the appointed time, so we can reap the harvest of the things he's called us to have. Hallelujah. Now, notice he said this, forsake not the work of your hands. One translation says this, Lord, complete in me what you started, and don't quit on me now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at that. Lord, Lord, just don't forsake the work of your hands. In other words, Lord... Finish in me what you started. And you know what David is saying here? David is saying, in the midst of your trouble, if you'll keep your eyes focused on the Lord, if you'll keep a worship attitude, if you'll keep a praise attitude, if you'll ask God to be your protector and guide, if you'll ask God to revive you and strengthen you in the midst of that thing, God will defeat your enemy, God will deliver you through the test, and God will complete in you what he started in your life. Meaning what? He'll take what the devil meant for bad and turn it for your good. He'll not only bless you he'll mature you and grow you even through this test but you have to make the decision what are you going to do in the test are you going to sow to your flesh murmur complain fuss gripe feel sorry for yourself be distressed oppressed and defeated or are you going to sow to the spirit and look to God and say Lord revive me Lord strengthen me Lord help me if you will, he'll bring you through that thing and do a mighty work in your life. Now look in the 85th Psalm. Psalm 85. Just drop back here a few pages to the 85th Psalm. And, and David is speaking some other things. He's talking about the whole Israel getting delivered and people coming back to God. And he says in Psalm 85 and verse 6, Will thou not revive us again? Now, I like that. Will thou not revive us again? That means he'd already had to revive them once before. Amen. Hallelujah. That, that, that brings hope to me. Hallelujah. Well, I thought you just got revived. I did, but I need another. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, how many revivings are you going to take? As many as I need. Hallelujah. See, I'm going to tell you something. Your rededicator may get worn, worn out, but your reviver will never. Hallelujah. You can be revived every morning. You can receive the reviving of God. Because you see, here's the thing you got to understand. To revive something, you had to first be vibed, didn't it? Amen. So that means it's down there. God just going to bring it back to life. Lord, I need my faith revived. That means you have faith. It just needs to be stirred back up again. Lord, I need my love revived. That means you've got love, but you're going to have it revived, stirred back up again. Lord, I need patience, but you, that means you have patience. You just need to be stirred back up again. You can't revive something that hasn't already been vibed. It's already got to be there. That means the children of Israel were walking with God, and now they've got to get back into fellowship with Him again. Amen? Now, notice this. Will thou not revive us again? Now, why do they need to be revived? That thy people may rejoice in thee. That thy people, thy people, God's people, may rejoice in God. You know what we need reviving in, folks? Revival is not like we think most of the time. We think revival is us having a week of meetings and everybody getting all hyped up and excited and coming to church and, and having shouting meeting all week. Oh, we had a revival. But then revival, nobody's changed. Because, you see, we tried to make an exterior thing. 
a revival really has to take place on the inside of the individual before it can take place in the church. Because, you see, revival isn't just the church growing. Revival isn't just the church shouting. Revival is your intimacy with God renewed. See, if I'm going to experience revival, it means I'm going to move back into an intimate relationship with the Lord. My fellowship with the Lord is put back into a strong place. It's back into a high place. Amen? I'm back on fire. My passion with God is restored. My zeal for the things of God is restored. Now, how do I know if I need a revival in my life? How do I know if I need to be revived? Well, there's a couple of symptoms here we can look at. Notice in verse 6, he says, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? The very first sign that you're going to find out if you need to be revived is this. Is this. You've lost your joy and you've lost your praise. Amen? How many of you went and looked in a mirror and thought you was looking at some old ugly, sired up prune, you know, and thought she was looking at a picture, and then you realize it's a mirror, and it was you on the other side. Amen? <laughs> huh? Because you see, this is the thing. One of the very first signs that you need revived is you're frowning all the time. You have nothing good to say. You're down and out, down in the mouth. Amen? I'll prove it to you. Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. In other words, they, they upset and sad. They remember how they were on fire for God. See, Babylon represents captivity. And they said, we sat down by the rivers and we remember how we used to shout. We remember how we used to praise. We remember how we used to be excited about going to church. We remember how we used to be excited about the Word of God. Oh, I remember back whenever I was, I was on fire. I mean, I was witnessing, letting people know Jesus, my Lord. I was praising God in the midst of even false gods. I mean, I praised Him on the job. I praised Him in home. I praised Him, I praised him in times of trouble. I remember that. And we cried. In other words, they're, they're mourning it. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. Your harp is your instrument of praise. In other words, I quit praising God like I should. There they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, saying sing us a song, one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, in a captive land? Notice this. If you'll let him, the devil will do this. The devil will come in and get you tired, get you fatigued, get you upset, get you to the place where you just don't, don't think it's worth it anymore. And he'll steal your joy. He'll steal your praise. He'll steal your excitement for God. And then he'll come along and say, now sing us one of them songs. Come on there, Miss Holy Roller. Let's see you do some rolling now. You don't look like much of a holy thing now, are you? Huh? You ever been there? The devil taunt you? Yeah, go ahead and sing in tongues now, loudmouth. You ain't got anything to sing about now, do you? Come on, sing us one of them songs y'all do down there. And you just sit there and you go, oh, oh. Well, you know what you need? You need revived. <laughs> Amen. That's a sign. I mean, I, I'm not excited. And, you know, people see you come and they go, oh, my God, here comes old ugly. They're going to have doom, despair, and agony all written all over. My God. They're coming to tell us what test they're in again. They're coming to tell us how bad they feel. They're coming to tell us how long it's been since they've been in church. They're coming to tell us how they used to believe, but they don't anymore. See, that's bondage. That's captivity. That's the enemy. And a lot of the church is in that. Oh, we just, we long for the days of the charismatic realm. Oh, I remember when people were excited for God. Well, can you remember when you was excited for God? Or has it been that long you can't remember that far back? Amen. No, no, he's talking about that's captivity, folks. That's weariness. That's what Paul is warning the Galatians over in Galatians about. He's saying, don't let yourself be fatigued and tired and get to the place where you just want to sit down. You know, this is the thing, folks. If you allow yourself to do that, how many of you know you get tired and you just stay in the same thing you're in? You'll just stay tired. You've got to change what's going on, don't you? Amen. Now, let's look at another thing. Psalm 85 goes on and he says this over here. He says, he says, revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee. So, so what we need to do, we need to revive ourselves and restore ourselves in the fellowship and intimacy with God. See, that doesn't mean that you go running off looking for another doctrine. That means you go running off find God again. 
Well, what happens whenever I actually get on fire for God and I get revival in my heart? Well, look in the 126th Psalm. You looked in the 137th Psalm. Look what he says in the 126th Psalm. How do I know if revival's coming to me? When the Lord turned again or brought back again the captivity of Zion. In other words, when I allow God to begin to work in my situation, whenever I begin to look to the Lord and I begin to ask God to help me and I begin to realize I need His help, I need Him to, 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 to defeat my enemy. I can't defeat Him. Remember the 138th Psalm? He said, with His arm, He'll stretch forth and smite His enemies, the wrath of His enemies, and with His right hand, He'll lift Him up. Lord, you see, revival begins when you begin to realize, God, I need Your help. I'm not acting right, doing right, talking right. This thing's affecting me, God. I need you to help me. I need you to restore me. I need you to, to stretch forth your hand. God, I believe in you. And so when we begin to turn to God, he says this, when the Lord, the Lord, see, I can't do it myself. I need the Lord to help me with this. He says, when the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. I want to ask you something today. Here's how you can tell whether you're operating out of vision and operating out of revival or you're operating out of fatigue and weariness. Are you living out of your dream or have you forgot it? Are you dreaming? Are you praising God? Are you speaking vision? Are you excited about tomorrow? Are you excited about what God's doing in your life? See, we're like those that dream. Actually, one translation I read, it said, we were like those that dream. It seems so unreal to us. It looked like a dream. I mean, this is so good, somebody pinch me. Hallelujah. Now look what else he says. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. When was the last time you had a good laugh? Amen. See, a lot of us hadn't laughed for a while. We've lost our laughter. Yeah, that's a lot of loss of joy. Then, they, 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 then he says, and our tongue with singing. When was the last time you had a good song of praise come up out of you? Then said they among the heathen, among the nations, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We're, we're glad. Hallelujah. See, here's the thing, folks. When you begin to experience revival in your life, you begin to experience a renewal of God in your life, it becomes noticeable. In fact, even sinners will notice it. You know what would happen to you in this service and would happen tomorrow on the job in different places if you allow God to touch you here in the next few moments and begin to turn your captivity, begin to renew your dream, begin to put laughter back in your mouth, begin to put a song of praise in your mouth, and you begin to act like that. When you go back to work, they're going to say, body snatchers at Charles Church because something took your body over what you yeah it was it was the reviving of God God took over where the devil was trying to amen in other words sinners could see the difference and folks if we're going to have revival that's going to reach the world it has to be a revival that first reaches our heart gotta start with me I've got to let God make me excited again I've got to get back where I trust the Lord again I've got to get back to where I'm doing the works of Jesus again amen now, how do I make this happen? How do I get revived? How do I come to God and say, Lord, help me? Look in Isaiah 57. Praise God. Anybody ready for this? Listen to what he says. Isaiah 57, verse 15. Listen to what Isaiah says. He's going to tell us. The prophet's going to give us exactly how to come through the midst of your trouble and be revived and not grow weary so you can walk in victory. Verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Notice God dwells in eternity. And God lives in the high and holy place. He lives there. He dwells there. Let me tell you something, folks. God does not live in the low place, the dark place, and the defeated place. Now, God will come down and visit that low place. But God won't live there. Why does God come down into the valley and visit? Because he comes to get us out to take us back up. God is not going to come to your house and help you have a pity party. Amen. God does not go to pity parties. You can give him an invitation. You can personalize it. And he will not come over and sit down with you and complain, fuss, and cry, and mourn, and mourn, and everything else. But in the midst of your struggle, remember over into the book of Acts, 
Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in jail at the 16th chapter because they were preaching the gospel. What happened? At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and had a pity party. No. That's a religious standard version. Amen. Amen. That's what we do today. No, at midnight, with their backs bleeding, their feet in stocks and chains, with things bad, with affliction, hardship, distress, pressure, the enemy tell them it ain't worth it. What did they do? They prayed and sang praises unto God. And what happened when they began to sing praises unto God? The power of God came down. God who dwells in the high and holy places and the lofty places. God came down into the bad place, shook the place so that they could come out of their place and come up to his place. Hallelujah. See, God is waiting on us to sow to the Spirit so that he can come in and revive us by his Spirit, defeat our enemy, and bring us out. Praise God. Now, you can decide to sit there in your chains. You can sit there in your sad, feel sorry for yourself circumstances. Or you can begin to turn to God and say, God, I need your help. I need revived. Lord, revive us. Lord, revive me. Amen? Now, what I need to do that? He tells you right here two things in verse 15. He says, I dwell with the, in the high and lofty place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The word contrite here, a lot of times we don't understand that. The word contrite means repentant, saddened, sorrowed, crushed. Lord, I don't like this. I don't like what I'm feeling. I don't want this in my life. Lord, I, I turn from this. See, contrite means I have come to a place of brokenness where I realize I need God, and Lord, I'm ready to turn from this. And humble means, God, I recognize I need you. I can't do this on my own. And he says when we come to a place where we're ready to change and we're ready to admit that we need God to help us make the change, God will come down and dwell with us and bring us out. Amen. The prodigal son. He decided he's going to do his own thing, live his own way. He took everything that he had been blessed with, went out and wasted it. And he's sitting there eating with the hogs. He finally came to himself. And he said, you know what? This is crazy. I had it better back on the farm with my dad and my brother. I mean, even though I had some problems with my brother, it was better than this. My dad loved me. What I need to do is i got to go back and tell him, I'm sorry, I missed it. Man, I don't want to live like this anymore. And the man got up and started walking his way back home. And you know, some of the reason I brought it in, I had problems with my brother. You need to understand, you're going to have problems in life with your brothers and with your sisters in the Lord. You, in fact, may be the person that's a little more quiet. And you were sitting today beside the loudest Christian in the church. And you're sitting there, and the thoughts come to you. I ain't coming back to this church again. Every time I come here, I sit beside the loudest, wildest, fanatic, crazy person I've ever been in my life. <laughs> well, yeah, the prodigal son said, you know, I had some real problems with my brother. He's always bossing me around. He's always telling me what to do. He's, uh, he's the older brother. He thinks he knows everything. But you know what? I'll put up with him if I can just get back with Dad. Because my daddy loved me so much. He blessed me. He took care of me. It's worth it going back to the Father's house. Because you see, if I go back there, I'll, I'll learn to get along with my brother. Because it's a whole lot better than not having God in my life at all. And you know what? We have to make up our minds. I'm going to accept you just like you are. You don't have to get up and dance in the aisle for me to love you. But don't fuss at me if I do. And you know what? I'm not expecting you to jump up and go, ha, 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 and got crazy just to, to prove to me that you are revived. What I'm going to look to is this. Are you involved? Are you serving the Lord? Are you sincere? Are you witnessing? Are you letting God work with your personality? See, not everybody's an extrovert, but everybody should be revived. Not everybody's going to shout and run and jump and carry on, but everybody ought to be praising God. Not everybody's going to be able to go out here and win 30 people to the Lord in the afternoon. But everybody ought to be open to every opportunity that comes to them to let their light shine and let people see Jesus in their life. And that's revival. And so, so God says, listen, you want to be revived? Here's what you do. Come to the place 
where you realize, I don't like being wearied. I don't like being depressed. I don't like being just feeling like it's not worth it. God, I need you. And I'm going to humble myself and call out to you, Lord, and I'm going to ask you to revive me. I'm going to ask you to anoint me with a fresh anointing. I'm going to ask you to put a passion in my heart. And, Lord, the reason I want to be revived is because I want my walk with you to be intimate. I want it to be personal. I want it to be passionate. I want to rejoice in you. See, when I lift my hands and praise God, folks, it's not so you can see it. It's so Jesus can see it. Whenever I pray and worship God, it's not so you can hear it. It's so Jesus can hear it. Are you hearing me? Because my rejoicing is unto the Lord. And now, you know, if we get to that place, we all experience revival. You know what happens? We individually experience a reviving, but we collectively and corporately experience a reviving. And the anointing of God comes in. And lives begin to get changed. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the word. We thank you, Holy Spirit for being in our midst. And Lord, we just give you glory and honor and praise. We thank you, Lord. And Lord, this day, as we bow our heads before you and close our eyes and search our own hearts, Father, help us to examine ourselves. Do I need revival in my life? Lord, do I need a fresh touch? Lord, have I allowed distress, affliction, trouble, struggle, pressures of life, disappointments, have I allowed them to steal my dreams? Have I allowed the, 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 the pressures of life to steal my joy and laughter and singing? If so, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. I turn to you. I turn to you. Oh, God, I turn to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Search your heart today. Are you on fire for God? Are you rejoicing in the Lord? Are you taking advantage of the opportunities that God wants to bring your way? We're starting this year. This is 2014. We need to press in. We, we need to be revived. We don't want to just walk through it in a deadness. We don't want to walk through it in a weariness. We don't want to walk through it in, in just, just survival mode. God, I want to experience the fire, the passion, the intimacy. I want to read your word and just let it jump off the pages and be excited about the word. I want to be excited about praising God. I want to be excited about going to church. I want to be excited about living for Jesus. I want to be excited, Lord, that even when a test comes, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're going to get me through. I want to be excited about dealing with it, praise God, instead of dreading it, being worried about it. Lord, revive me that I might rejoice in you that I might fellowship with you, that my actions should be pleasing to you. That's where we're at today. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, you need to come to Him today. You need to give your life to Him, surrender your heart to Him, minister to Him. If you've been like the prodigal son, you've been away from the Lord, you need to come back. You need to come back. You need to come back. Well, somebody did me wrong. Yeah. So you're going to let that wrong person keep you from enjoying the benefits of your Father? Of your Lord? No. Forgive them. Remember what Paul said? As opportunity comes, do good to those that deserve it and those that don't deserve it. Do the right thing. The right thing is this, Lord, I come to you with a contrite and a humble heart. A heart that's broken, a heart that's repentant, a heart that's surrendered, a heart that's hungry for you. I want you to come into my heart, come into my life. If you're a Christian today, but you've lost that passion and that zeal, you just need to come to God and say, Lord, revive me. It's there. I know it's there. Just stir it up within me. You put it in me, Lord. I'm your workmanship. God, you started a work in me. I'm asking you to complete it and perfect it. I'm asking you to, to continue, Lord. I'm asking you to, to do something in me that, that only you can do. And I'm yielding myself to you to do it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand with me all over this house. 
And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the next few moments. And you know, if the Lord leads, I'll come and pray with you. But here's what I want to do. If you'd like to God to just touch you. And you know, here's the thing. David said, revive me, Lord. In the midst of trouble, David wasn't backslid. He'd already told you he was serving God with his whole heart and worshiping God toward his temple and praising him for his word. But David was going through a test. You know what David did? David, in the test, realized how much more he needed God. You know what your test should do? Your distressful situation, the pressure you're in right now, the problem you're facing, it shouldn't drive you away from God. It should make you aware of the fact that you need God even that much more. I mean, yeah. If I go into the weight room and they put 100 pounds on the bar and I press it, hallelujah. How many of you know if they put 200 on, I'm going to need some more power? 200 pounds doesn't, you know, if they increase it, that doesn't mean that I should quit, but it just does mean also that I'm going to need more strength to get it up if I'm going to do this. When a test comes, folks, that ought not say to you, well, I ain't going to try that. Especially if you've got to get through the test to get where you're going. What you have to do is say, I know what this test is for. It's to show me how much more I need the power of God in my life. So I'm going to draw from it. I'm going to reach out to it. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to take a few moments. And if you need God to just touch you, Lord, I want to be revived. I want laughter in my mouth. I want joy. I want a different perspective. I, I, don't want, I, I want this weariness, tiredness, fatigue off of my faith. I want it out of my life. And Lord, I want you to anoint me today and just fan the flame of fire in my life. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to open this altar up and we're going to let you come down here. And you can kneel. You can stand. You can do what you want to do. But it's a moment that you can take between you and God and say, Lord, I'm putting this in your hands. I'm asking you to stretch forth your hand and take care of this problem and strengthen me through this problem and help me to walk through this in victory. And Lord, I'm asking you to perfect in me what I need concerning me. And I'm asking you to do in me what I need done. And Lord, this day I'm asking you to put a fresh anointing of your power and your faith and your zeal and your passion in my life. Amen.